Namaskaram. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. I'm really honored. Um, I want to thank everyone who was involved in the organization of this conference. It's a great pleasure to be here. So um, I, I will be starting this session, and I must say that I am not working in artificial intelligence, so um, this will be a recreational talk, but hopefully some of you will find interest in my research. Um, so I am an associate professor at the University of Caen in Normandy. This is north of France. Um, it's a very old university. Um, we have a phoenix as a symbol because it was entirely destroyed between, um, bef during the war, sorry, and it was entirely rebuilt. Um, but it is a very old in institution, and I have been working there for about 12 years now. I specialize in the study of the brain of premature neonates. Um, these are newborns who were born too early, so a typical gestation lasts for about 37 to 42 weeks in the womb of the mother, but about 11% of babies in metropolitan France are born too early. Um, but that can go up to 15% of babies in different countries. These preterm births are due to multiple related fact risk factors, such as air pollution or mother stress or toxics. And for this reason, premature births are actually increasing throughout the world. So this is a very important um, public health problem. So what is exactly the effect of premature birth on the baby's brain? Well, the problem is that birth occurs during cortical folding, um, and during the third trimester of pregnancy, um, the formation of the gray and white matter is ongoing very quickly, and an interruption and physiological disorganization at this stage can have uh, long-lasting consequences on the baby's brain. What is happening in the brain at that time? So I have made here a rectangle in red. So I'm sorry, it's probably a bit small for you um, up there. But essentially, we have at that time um, the branching of axons and, and dendrites. We also have axon projection. And we have the formation and, um, and um, pruning of synapses. So all these processes in the brain are dependent on experience. By that, I mean sensory experience. So a baby who's supposed to have in utero experience during the process of network formation will have the sensory experience of being in the neonatal intensive care unit. And I will show you that is a very different environment that has long-lasting consequences as well. On this uh, disorganized branching and synapse formation, we must add neuro, uh, neural injuries such as vascular damage that can happen as a consequence of premature birth. I will not be talking about that, but this is something that can add a burden to brain development in neonates. On top of neurological impairments that can happen due to premature birth at a time when the brain is not ready, we must add a irrelevant, at best, but mostly aversive sensory environment. I mean by that that for several weeks and sometimes several months, the baby will experience sensory events that have no meaning, that are not socially relevant, um, that have um, a very uh, chaotic structure in time, um, and also they will undergo multiple painful procedures, such as blood draws, um, repeatedly, sometimes multiple times a day. So this will exert a very a strong constraint on brain development. We have, um, throughout the world, seen in the recent years, I would say maybe last 15 years, the development of uh, special um, procedures for taking care of these early born children, such as skin to skin that we call kangaroo care, and um, this is practiced in most NICUs now, but it can only partially compensate for the aversive environment. And so we still have um, a very different brain development in these children. The problem is that um, as a consequence, these children will have 
permanent disabilities. And these disabilities can be very severe. So um, this is actually a follow-up study from French cohorts of preterm babies. And as you can see, the earliest they were born, so actually the youngest we, um, we place them in intensive care is usually 22, 23 weeks of gestation. When they were born that early, um, the survival rate is actually low, but this is only survival, meaning they have um, bad outcomes. If we go to survival without severe disability, it's a little worse. And then if we just um, graph the children who will survive without any neurodevelopmental disability, it's actually very low. So it's 20% or less of the children for the extreme premature one. And then it can go up to 60% of these children surviving without any neurodevelopmental disability at best if they are born about um, two to three weeks before term. So that's still a very poor outcome in general. Now, if we look um, closer to the type of disability that these children have, um, we can, for example, take this um, English cohort of uh, very preterm neonates, most of them will have a four to five fold increase in um, hyperactive and attention deficits. Um, they also have a three to four um, fold increase in emotional disorders or conduct disorder. And they have a strong, strong risk of developing autism spectrum disorder. I was really happy to learn that here you will soon have an autism uh, research center. This is really good news. I think we really need these centers to take better care of these children. So more specifically, um, what is it that I look at? So um, I'm looking at the early markers of neurodevelopmental disorders in preterm children. When we look at these children and we follow them up, we see many types of, of issues, one of them being uh, attention deficits, another being motor deficits, and another one being atypical sensory profiles. Interestingly, these types of issues are exactly the same that we observe in children who would later on develop neurodevelopmental disorders. It is on purpose that I do not discriminate, discriminate between uh, attention deficit hyperactivity or autism because at the age I'm interested in, we cannot discriminate these children. We know they are going to have some neurodevelopmental disorder, but the core deficits when they are very young do not allow us to say which syndrome it will be. That appears later. And what I want to do is be able to distinguish the problem before it becomes a full-blown syndrome. So I'm only interested in a cross-syndromic approach. More specifically, I am interested in sensory profiles because this is the type of um, phenomenon we can observe in very, very young children. So I want to be able to look at neonates and see if a specific neonate has an increased risk of developing a syndrome. So I'm looking at sensory profiles in these children, trying to figure out if there could be a, a common pathological process between children who are born preterm and children who later on develop neurodevelopmental disorders, even though they are not born preterm. If we closely observe sensory profiles in these populations, we can see that they actually have the same types of profiles with increased impairment in tactile sensitivity um, and a responsiveness to uh, sensory um, inputs in general, and then low energy and, and lack of auditory filtering. So this is an atypical profile for premature neonates and this is atypical sensory profiles for autistic children who were not born preterm. And you can see the exact same profiles. That's why I think there could be something in common and that we could measure it very early on. So what is my, um, my theory? Well, it's not only me, of course, but the theory I work with um, as to why there is a link between these two populations. To, to be short, because I have only 30 minutes, let's say I believe that the fact of being born premature plus having atypical sensory inputs in a very plastic uh, period of development will 
provide the child with the wrong um, networks, and these networks form the basis of what we call predictive um, processing in the brain. By that, I mean the fact that our brain can predict future sensory inputs based on experience. This forms the basis of um, prediction and suppression. Prediction is our ability to know what, what is going to happen to us. For example, when I touch this table, I know how it's going to feel before I can touch it. And I'm not surprised. So this is a very important skill for developing attention. And suppression is the feeling that when I know what is happening and it's not important to me, I can suppress that information to focus on what's relevant. These two phenomena in the brain can be measured very young, and they form the basis of attention, which will normally evolve to executive function and later on to school and social achievement. But in children who have a typical sensory profile, we believe that attention will be affected very early. Oops, sorry. And because attention will develop atypically, these children will have difficulty regulating their behavior, will have a difficulty with executive functions, and then later will develop neurodevelopmental disorders that puts them at risk of school failure. Um, about 20 years ago, people in Paris published this um, paper that I used to cite because it's a paper using electroencephalography uh, measurements, so EEG measures um, electrical potential of neurons that are active, and as the authors repeated the same stimulus, you can see that brain activity in the temporal area of the child, because it was auditory processing, gradually goes down because as the same input is repeated, it becomes irrelevant because it's known, but it's not interesting. So we can see this suppression that I will talk about during my talk. But if we change the input we propose, you can see that neuronal activity will peak again. So this is a marker that the child was um, predicting a type of input and another input was proposed and that is a reaction to a novelty. So this forms the basis of my work. Um, so I will present to you two studies, one that was, the one that was published um, about two years ago and one that is um, currently ongoing and should be published this year for the first part and then um, two other parts will be published later. These are the people who work with me. So on the left, you can see my three PhD students. Um, so most of the data I will be presenting were performed by these students. And on the right, you can see um, the two head of the NICU at the Caen University Hospital, who have been of tremendous help uh, for us to allow um, our research in their unit. And of course, the babies and the parents I want to thank because nothing would be possible without their consent. So, I'm not doing MRI. I will be doing MRI um, in part two of, um, of my research, but I will not be presenting MRI today. I use EEG, so this is the direct measure of neuronal activity through electric potentials. And I also use neurovascular coupling. So, I'm assuming you are all familiar with FNIRS. Um, this is uh, now a very common measure of brain activity in neonates and infants, but I did not want to use that technique for the first experiment I'm going to present because it is slow. So I will be presenting results that were obtained with diffuse correlation spectroscopy, which is the measure of blood flow increase that follows very quickly neuronal activity increase. This first study was performed with my student Victoria Dumont and the help of the Institute for Photonics in Barcelona, Spain. Um, the, the aim of this first study was to show the ability to predict sensory input and to suppress irrelevant inputs in the somatosensory cortex of preterm neonates. And the second aim was to determine if the predictability of the stimulus was an important feature of what they perceive and if they use this information to regulate processing, meaning if they know that something is going to happen, do they suppress it? And if they are sure it's going to happen, do they suppress it better 
than when they are unsure. This is what we do as adults. We use the somatosensory modality because it is the fundamental sense at that age. So it was very important for me to go to a modality that is very basic and fundamental during development. And also because, as I told you, it is very often atypical in neurodevelopmental disorders, such as autism. So it was interesting for us to see what happens in this modality. So for that first study, we had 40 premature neonates that were sampled and then were randomized between two groups. All of them were born at 31 to 32, and we tested them at 33 of corrected gestational age. The first condition was a condition when um, there is a three seconds vibration on the palm of the hand, and there's a five second interval when nothing happens. This is fixed. So normally when you feel that sequence, you know that something is going to happen every five seconds. And sometimes a stimulus was omitted, uh, meaning that it should happen, but it did not. And in the second condition, we have the same vibrations, but we have jittered intervals. So the baby knows something is going to happen, but it cannot know exactly when. Omissions, like I said, are essentially um, times during the sequence where something should have happened and it was not presented. So our hypothesis is that there will be an activation in the contralateral somatosensory cortex during omissions, and that we will see a decreased activation to stimuli along the sequence. What is diffuse correlation spectroscopy? So very quickly, it is a technique where we measure cerebral blood flow by um, shining a long coherence length laser through the, through the tissues, and this uh, laser will be scattered by moving scatterers, and the only moving scatterers in the brain, yep, the only moving scatterers in the brain are um, red blood cells. So that will create a speckle pattern that we can detect using a photon counting photodiode. And we just calculate the autocorrelation function between what we measure and what we send. And this function will vary in its inflection point depending on the speed of the red blood cells. So if it moves left, it means there's more, more um, flow coming in. And if it moves right, the flow is slowing down. So this is a more direct measure of neurovascular coupling than FNIRS. But it has the same advantage as being silent and portable and easily put on the child's head in the NICU, meaning it's not like MRI where you have to take the baby out of the incubator and put in the scanner. This can be performed at the bedside with the parents attending the measurements, which is very reassuring. So we measure brain activity in the cortex as we are presenting these stimuli. What we observed is that, indeed, there is suppression of activity. So when the stimulus is actively presented, there is suppression. Um, and this suppression is very high when um, the interval was fixed. But it is not present when the intervals were jittered, meaning the stimulus, well, the, the processing is only suppressed when the stimulus is entirely predictable. Now, this is what we observed during omission. So the baby was expecting a sensory input, but nothing was presented. And here, you can see that there is a decrease in brain baseline activity. So there's an active suppression of whatever is supposed to come in when the stimulus is um, deterministic it is not the case, so this is an anticipatory processing response when the stimulus is not um, actually predicted. So we show here for the first time the predictive activity in the brain before the age of term, and also we show that this is an active top-down regulation of sensory processing. This is very interesting because now we want to know if this is related to outcome. Is this dependent on how the baby's um, faring um, from a neurodevelopmental standpoint. 
So the second study I'm going to present is an ongoing study. We are aiming to describe neuronal activity. I'm also measuring um, optical uh, activity, but I, I will only be presenting EEG today. This time, we are measuring babies that were born at any gestational age so we can investigate the effect of se the severity of preterm birth and also the number of painful procedures they undergo before we measure them. We want to, affect, to uh, assess the effect of both variables on sensory processing. So we are aiming at 90 subjects. We have three groups, extremely preterm babies that have undergone about 100 um, painful procedures before we measure them. We have a um, mid preterm group and we have a late preterm group. At this point, we have about 20 children included, so this is only preliminary data. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, this is the distribution of the gestational ages we have included so far, and we measure them all at the same equivalent age. So this is really the effect of how, how long they spend in the NICU and how early they were born that we are looking at. So we still measure them in the somatosensory cortex with a high-density EEG um, system, and we propose a vibration on the forearm that goes up and down. This is how it looks like in the NICU. This is my student, Victoria. And we have this protocol. On this protocol, we have the beginning where it's only the same vibration for them to habituate. And the end, it's again the same 40 vibrations to, to compare if there was a suppression. And in between, we propose, um, when you see those nice animations, you can tell that my students made this diet, because I never do this. This is my students doing. Um, so we propose the same types of vibration, but some of them go up instead of going down. So these are deviants. They're unexpected. And we also have omissions. Something should have happened, and it didn't. And so we want to see what the child does when it happens again. Thanks. So this is the direct measurement of EEG activity. In the very preterm group, we can see a nice suppression. So the suppressed um, curve is purple, and the initial curve is green. So you can clearly see that it's been suppressed, and this is what we wanted to see. But what is interesting is the suppression is still very visible in the mid-premature range, but in the late preterm children, we do not see it anymore. There is no difference between the beginning and the end of the sequence, and that's unexpected, because our hypothesis was that the late preterm children are faring better, and if they are faring better, then they should be better at any cognitive test that we propose, and instead it's the reverse. The suppression is better for the children who were born the youngest and have undergone many painful procedures. So it could be the effect of exposure to the outside world that make them better at suppressing sensory information. And actually, that's what we see when we um, graph the correlation of the amplitude of the suppression, so how much they suppress versus gestational age at birth. Interestingly, when we correlate with the number of painful procedure each patient has undergone during the stay, we can also see a correlation. Um, so the more they have painful procedures happening, the more they suppress any type of sensory input, even a non-painful vibration. So this is interesting to us. Now, what happens when we compare the deviant stimulation that is new to the familiar one? Well, the more premature neonates, there is no difference. They do not perceive the difference. The mid-premature babies, they kind of perceive the difference between the two. And then the late preterm babies, they have this, ni this nice mismatch response. So babies who have less experience, they suppress everything. Sorry, the babies who have less experience do not suppress everything. And they keep the ability to discriminate between the new and the familiar stimulus. The babies who were born, the more preterm, they suppress every type of input, but they have no discrimination when something new happens. 
And this is the same type of correlation that we observe when we um, look at um, the amplitude of the mismatch response versus gestational age at birth or versus painful procedures. I am not showing any um, significance measure or significance calculation on purpose because, as I said, this is preliminary and I do not want to convey any wrong conclusion today. But on preliminary data, the linear regression that we performed shows that there is a clear difference between the groups and as we, um, as we use the stational age as a regressor, we can see that um, experience of the neonatal intensive care unit environment make them suppress information that could be relevant to learning. So we believe this is an important information. These babies, they just suffer for too much aversive sensory input. So as I say, this may compromise sensory development later on. It could impair attention development long term. And this is why we are just starting part two of this project. Part two is actually starting Monday. So when I come back on Monday, we will be having the follow-up at two years old of the first two children we um, measured when they were newborns. And what we want to see in these children when they come back to the lab at age two is whether we can still see a difference between tactile processing um, and is that correlated to how they were processing when they were newborns. We want to also um, evaluate motor development executive development, we have autism screening tests, uh, attention deficit measurements, and we also have a sleep and physiological regulation measurement that's on seven days, um, the baby's wearing a small activity um, measure uh, so we can see how well they are sleeping and how well they're regulating their behavior. And hopefully we will see them again when they are four to see if some of them have neurodevelopmental disorder. So this is part two. I can talk to you about this part two maybe in a couple of years. And there is also part three that I did not have the time to talk to you about, but we, at the same age, we are measuring EEG in the neonatal ICU. We are taking MRI um, images for only the very preterm sample. And we will be performing um, volumes, um, measurements, and tractography uh, analysis on this age group. We have so far included 11 subjects. So um, this is too early for me to tell you what's going on. But the idea is to compare the development of attention networks to sensory processing measurements to outcomes at age two and four. What am I, why am I doing this? How many minutes do I have left? Five minutes? Yes, yeah, five minutes, that's great. So why am I doing all this? Some of you might think that it would be helpful to have a very early diagnosis tool. So far, this is the most frequent feedback I got on this study, but I do not believe this is the most important thing because for the, for the moment, we simply do not know what type of intervention we should be proposing to these kids. Meaning, if I am able to tell a baby that has a strong neurodevelopmental risk, I do not know what to do about it. So I don't think it's a good idea to be able to tell the parents, your child is at risk, not now. What I want to do is to use these measurements to evaluate not the babies, but the intervention programs. I'm not sure about India, but in France, we have many different types of people, such as speech therapists, um, that propose interventions, very early interventions for autism spectrum disorder, for, for attention deficits, but there is no scientific validation of these interventions. It costs a lot of money, and we don't know if it works. So what I want to do is first evaluate, is NICU intervention making a difference to sensory processing? Is infant massage making a difference. And once I'm able to say this intervention is promising or it is not, then maybe I will consider telling the parents about my results. Just before I leave, I want to let you know that if you are interested in neonatal brain imaging, please come to our conference. I am co-chairing the scientific program of the fetal neonatal toddler neuroimaging group. It's going to happen in Baltimore in September. Um, we want to have as many people from around the globe coming to this conference, 
So if you're into neonatal brain, um, you can check out the website. We'll be putting the, the program during the next month of, on, the, on the website. And if you want to talk to me about research or anything, um, you can contact me by email at any time and, of course, uh, join on social networks. Thank you. Long live India and France friendship.